Bailey's theories, Pell the Plunger was now known as a man of action, industry, and vision. And his greatest triumphs were yet to come. Insurance was even bigger business in the stock market. Mining, too, saw millions of dollars pass hands daily. Henry saw plenty of opportunity and plunged again. Henry learned to control deals from all the angles, as the buyer, the seller, and even the broker, and made a fortune. He was asked to join boards and hold directorships with dozens of major corporations across the nation and even the world. He was involved in all kinds of industries, from insurance, telegraph, steel, railroads, mining, land development. He controlled 25% of the Canadian economy directly. But Pellet's vision wasn't always perfect. One time he invested in sugar beets, certain that they would replace regular cane sugar. Fortunately for him, his other ventures were more successful. Too bad, Henry. Henry Pellet climbed the ranks of the Queen's own rifles. Indeed, he climbed faster than anyone, two steps at a time. In 1901, with the high rank of Lieutenant Colonel, Henry became the regiment's commanding officer. When the future king and queen of England visited Toronto in 1902, Henry, the commanding officer, received them in style. He arranged for more than 11,000 troops to meet the royal couple. The celebrations were spectacular. Henry even spent thousands of his own dollars to decorate the city. Hosting royalty appealed to him. He bought some property just north of the city, high atop a hill. Spanish for a house on the hill, it would become Casa Loma. The view was fit for a king and queen. From the hilltop, Mary and Henry could see for miles all the way to the tall clock tower of City Hall and the glistening water of Lake Ontario. They couldn't see the cliffs of there or falls from there, but the roar of her waters was ringing in Henry's ears. Henry's biggest business venture would become the most important electrical development in Ontario. He would try to harness the power of the mighty Niagara. Nothing of this scale had ever been attempted. Henry teamed up with electricity mogul Frederick Nichols and his old partner William McKenzie. Together they were forced to be reckoned with. They applied to the government of Ontario to be the first Canadians to build a power generating station at Niagara Falls and waited for approval. In June of 1902, Lieutenant Colonel Pellet attended the coronation of King Edward VII in London with a contingent of the Queen's own rifles and hoped for his own crowning glory. Knighthood was a tremendous honor. In 1905, Prime Minister of Canada Wilfrid Laurier would send his recommendation to the King of England. There were many men to choose from. For his service in the military and achievements in business, and especially for bringing electric light to the city, Henry Mill Pellet became Sir Henry Mill Pellet, Knight Bachelor. The newly appointed financier barely had time to open the letters of congratulations. The Ontario government approved the hydroelectricity power station at Niagara Falls, and construction was underway. The task was enormous. They had to blast through the hard rock cliffs of the falls as 600,000 gallons of water passed over each second. The drop was 170 feet down. It would be the largest hydroelectric project in the world. If they could manage it. And they did. The accomplishment was nothing short of a triumph of man over nature. Even the powerhouse they built was monumental. Designed by the famous Toronto architect, Edward J. Lennox, it was more like a temple fit for the gods. Even the gods could not change what fate had in store. Adam Beck was a vocal opponent of private enterprise. The provincial minister of parliament argued that hydroelectricity belonged to the people and should be run by the people. He said electricity should be as free as air. Free electricity, or at least the promise of it, was an irresistible offer to Ontario voters. The Ontario government 
the same government that granted them the franchise just a few years earlier stepped in to regulate the market. Adam Beck was made the head of the new regulatory agency, the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario. It was a disaster for Kellett, Nichols, and McKenzie, and the electrical development company. For all the hard work, labor, and planning, for the feats of engineering, and for the millions of dollars invested, the company would receive no settlement or compensation. It was the first enterprise to send power from Niagara Falls to Toronto later that year, but the accomplishment went largely unmarked or celebrated. Worse, the Toronto Electric Light Company also lost its franchise. It was a huge disappointment, but the Lieutenant Colonel marched on to make one of the most generous contributions the country had ever seen. It all started casually enough. Wouldn't it be something, Sir Henry wondered, if the Queen's own competed in the annual military games in England? The King heard of the idea. Canadian troops had never participated before. He accepted. And this presented many problems. The Canadians were inexperienced and ill-equipped, and now were competing as one of the oldest, most organized armies in the world. With only nine months to prepare before the maneuvers, it seemed impossible. But Pellet arranged everything for training and uniforms, and paid for the entire expedition personally. When they arrived, escorted by their commanding officer, Sir Henry, they received a hero's welcome. The boys earned their nation's pride, too, performing surprisingly well in the military exercises. 670 riflemen and officers went to England in 1910, and the trip overseas changed their lives forever. Meanwhile, in Toronto, construction crews had just broken ground in the most impressive private residence in Canadian history. It was another masterpiece by Edward J. Lennox. The House of a Hundred Rooms, it was going to have every imaginable luxury. A castle fit for the King of Finance and his Queen. Although much of the castle was still under construction, the pellets moved into their new home. The average price of a house in Toronto was two and a half thousand dollars. The pellets planned to spend two hundred and fifty thousand on theirs. Only the finest building materials were used, from Carrera marble to Burmese teak. And only the furniture and artwork fit for royalty was used to decorate. Sir Henry and Lady Mary were marvelous hosts. They threw lavish parties with dancing and dining and merriment. They loved to entertain inside and out, especially in their prize-winning gardens. There they are, having a wonderful time. Sir Henry built the castle hoping one day to entertain royalty. Sometimes Mary and Henry would steal a private moment just for two. They would have dinner just like other couples. Other couples who lived in castles. It was very romantic. Sir Henry was a sociable fellow. He belonged to all the prestigious clubs in the city. His friends called him gregarious and likable, a natural leader. Dalhousie University honored him with a doctorate of civil law. Sir Henry said the DCL stood for a darn crazy lunatic. Mary was a go-getter with her husband. When she took over the Girl Guides of Canada in 1912, there were only 250 members. By the time she stepped down nine years later, there were 17,000, and her guides often visited Casa Loma. The Pellets believed in community and philanthropy. They made countless donations to charities and good causes. It seemed like they were living a wonderful life. But not everyone appreciated Casaloma. Some people thought it was flamboyant, and that was just the beginning of problems to come. With World War declared, construction of Casaloma was put on hold. The workers went off to join the fight. The supplies were put towards a war effort. Pellet, now 55, could not serve overseas, but he had his own battle brewing at home. Cost 
for the castle exceeded all expectations. Three and a half million dollars, and it was still not finished. Maintenance alone cost $50,000 per year. It was being called Pellet's Folly. Despite all appearances, Pellet's finances were not nearly as sound as they seemed. He owed $1 million to the Dominion Bank, and another $2 million to the Home Bank. He was desperately overextended. Only a miracle would save him financially. And then he thought he found it. Sir Henry and some partners were the first Canadians to invest in aviation. It was a brand new industry. They were going to set up an air service. They built a factory and a school for pilots. If aviation took off, Pellet would be able to save himself financially. But it was not to be. Sir Joseph Lebel, chairman of the Imperial Munitions Board, appropriated the factory and school for the war effort. Sir Henry was running out of money quickly. He put his hopes in an oil dig in Louisiana, but again, he had no luck. No luck and no oil. His well had run dry. On Saturday, August 18, 1923, the caretaker of the Home Bank of Canada nailed a simple handwritten sign to the front doors. The bank had run out of money. It would never open again. The bank's officers were arrested, for they had carried an enormous amount of bad debt, including pellets. It was a stunning blow to depositors. Thousands of people lost their life savings. The whole bank's collapse brought pellet down too. Like the bank, Sir Henry had run out of money and had nowhere now to borrow more. Unable to pay the cost of Casaloma, the pellets were forced to leave their home. They brought just a few of their belongings to a large apartment down the street. No fewer than five deaths were associated with the home bank's bankruptcy, including Colonel James Cooper Mason, Sarah Calder, Captain T.S. O'Connor, Herbert J. Daly, and Lady Mary Pellet herself. She had been sick for years with heart disease, often confined to her bedroom or wheelchair. On the 15th of April, 1924, her heart could take no more. Sir Henry was devastated. Just two months later, his heart would break a second time. Henry auctioned off his belongings, treasures and mementos he had collected over a lifetime to pay back some of his debts. Even Lady Mary's wheelchair could not avoid the auction block. He said it was one of the saddest days of his life. He did not make much money from the sale, only a small fraction of what his things were worth. The auction of the century was the bargain of a lifetime. The swimming pool, the bowling alley, and much of the west wing of Casa Loma were not completed. For years, the castle sat empty and started to deteriorate. Sir Henry was down but not out. He retreated to Mary Lake, his county estate in King City, and he thought he could find the happiness of earlier times by marrying again. His new wife, Catherine Mullen Merritt, was a family friend. But just two years after their marriage, she too died, making him a widower for the second time. And making matters worse, the stock market crashed on that notorious Black Tuesday in October of 1929. What little Pellet had left financially was finished. His castle stood in ruins and was appropriated by the city of Toronto for back taxes. Sir Henry's son Reginald, who was also a stockbroker, was in trouble too. But Pellet used his influence to keep him afloat. Pellet was forced to move from home to home, house to apartment. Meanwhile, the city of Toronto had trouble figuring out what to do with a crumbling castle. In 1937, the Kiwanis Club, a charitable organization, proposed to restore the castle and open it for tourists. 
Helen was broke, but he was not broken. He returned to Casaloma for the opening ceremonies. He said, I built Casaloma as a place where people would enjoy themselves. It could not be put to a better use. I am satisfied. He was left with his memories. The man who won the one by one, who brought electric light to Toronto streets, who married his childhood sweetheart, who became the commanding officer of the Queen's own rifles, and a doctor of civil law, was penniless. He moved into the home of his old chauffeur, Tom Ridgway, but his last years were lonely. Reginald did not visit often. His niece Mary visited from time to time. He called her girl because her name arrives too many memories. On Sir Mary's 80th birthday, the Queen's own rifles threw a party, a lavish affair at the luxurious Royal York Hotel. The boys get taken to England, now men, saluted their commanding officer. There were speeches, toasts, and tributes, and one by one, the men rose and sang. Sir Henry was moved beyond words. Just two months later, these men would gather again to say goodbye to the old man. In the words of Toronto newsman Frank Griffin, Trust me, he did not live to the full limits of his gifts. He did good, more good than most men. He left his mark, and he had a grand time.